welcome to the Call by God podcast with Adney Godin and myself, Nixon Sylvain. This show is about dialogues of biblical characters and testimonies of Christians who submitted to the will of God. Each week, we'll bring on one guest so that they can share their story of how they were called by God. I hope this show inspires you. Enjoy. Hello and welcome, world, to the Call by God podcast. I'm yours truly, Nixon Sylvain, and I'm with Adney Godin. Adney Godin, how are you doing, my sister? Good morning, Brother Nick. Let me tell you something. When you know you're doing the will of God, Satan gets busy. And when he gets busy, you just have to be more in tune with God to make sure that God's will is done and his purpose is um, fulfilled. And we just say to Satan that he will not win and we rebuke him in the name of Jesus, right? Um, But how are you doing? I am. I'm blessed. I'm blessed, Adnia. I know that, you know, when you know that God is walking with you and he's talking with you, it's like Adam, right? He was walking and talking with Adam in the garden. And then when, 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 you know, Adam and Eve, you know, ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, there was a disconnect. The relationship was shattered. So I just thank God that um, he came and he gave his life as a ransom for us. And, and now we could rekindle with him. We have that relationship with him. So, when you know, when you know that there's someone that sits high and looks low and he loves you and he walks with you, I mean, that's just a reason to smile and a reason to feel good about today. So, so I'm excited. I'm thankful and I'm, I'm feeling good. I'm feeling good about, about our next guest. But, but before we bring her on, I want to thank um, all of our listeners, all of our supporters out there, especially the reviews that, that we've, uh, you know, received um, on our uh, website. So Adney, I, you want to take some time and just read one review. We want to get in the habit of reading a review um, every, every episode. All right. This review says impactful and relevant podcast. I really enjoy this podcast, the interviews and the deep Bible study. So proud of you all for stepping out on faith and continuing this ministry. So many people need to hear these stories to either continue their walk or to start their walk. I bless God for you all and pray that you press towards the mark of your high calling in Christ. God has started a great work and he will finish it through you all. Amen. Amen. I like that. God has started a good work and he's going to finish it through us. Well, God is using all his children. That's the beauty of it, right? Because we're all a body and everybody has a a part to play. Um, So again, I want to, whoever wrote that review, I want to thank them um, for writing that review. It always touched my heart, Adney. I don't know about you, but it touches mine. It definitely does, Brother Nick. It, It does because it's encouraging to know that this is not done in vain. It's done. Um, number one, God is getting the glory. Number two, lives are being touched. So definitely touches my heart. All right, Adney, without further ado, you know, drum bell, drum rope. <laughs> well, our next guest, we're going to um, bring in our next guest. And, and I'm looking forward uh, to hearing her story, her God-given story. And um, without further ado, uh, Sister Kimberly Hardy, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. So glad to be here with you all this morning. Look, it is good to have you. Uh, you know, every time someone comes on here and, and you know, for an interview, it's always a blessing for me to take heed and just to listen to uh, uh, their story. I always find that that was fascinating. Again, we want to welcome you onto the show, add you and to add a few you want to say something to your sister? <laughs> Kimberly, um, I met you in 2020 and I feel like, you know, we've known each other since we were growing up, like my house, your house type trip, because um, God, this relationship is a relationship I realize is God ordained. And when God ordains a relationship, you just have to just walk through it because he knows what we both needed and he he's moving through it. So I thank you so much, my dear sister, for um for coming on and answering the call when I send you this text to 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 come on. Amen. I am so grateful to see what God has done during this pandemic and just bringing people, faith, and Christians together. And uh, you have become so dear to me during this time. So I'm just I am just grateful. 
Yeah. Amen. So, Sister Kim, um, I want you to share with our listeners, um, you know, before we get into your story, just share with our listeners what you're about. All right. So um, I am a, a Christian woman. I am an educator and I currently reside in Tennessee. I have uh, four siblings and my parents live in Texas and um, I live in Tennessee, like I said. <laughs> um, I've been an educator for about 18 years now and um, I, I love theater. I love music. Um, I, I love uh, walk in the park by the lake and seeing um, the, the nature. Is I enjoy laughing and having a good time with friends and family, even if it's even if it's virtual via all these virtual platforms. <laughs> <laughs> hey Amen. That's that's well said. So I know we're going to have a great time. We got a sister from all the way from Tennessee. So I know we're going to have a great time just sitting back and just listening to your story. So what the Call of God podcast is about, we like to to interview and we like to bring Christians on um, from all walks of life to share their story, how God have called them from darkness into his marvelous light. And um, we always give Christians that opportunity. We believe that testimonies are powerful. Everybody has a story of, of where they came from. And especially I, I like to say the phrase like, God, when when God called you from darkness, you know, um, and brought you to his light, that's a good place to be in. That's a real, real good place to be in. And I, I sometimes say, like, I don't know where I would have been if it wasn't for the grace and the mercy of God. So it's not about me, Sister Kim, but I just thought I'd add that in there. So, Sister Kim, you know, we want you to go way, way back as much as you can and just think about the origin, how everything started and unfold um, uh, of, of your call. So kind of like paint a picture for us and we want to hear um, all that God has done for you throughout the whole years before you were saved and to the point of salvation. Okay. Well, um, I was raised in the church. My dad is a minister of the gospel and has been a minister of the gospel my entire life. So um, I grew up hearing him preach, you know, all throughout all Sunday and, you know, in, in the house preparing for sermons and everything. So when I was um, about six years old, I remember it was a Sunday evening and um, dad was preaching about the death angel. And he was talking about how this death angel would come to basically um, to harvest <laughs> humans that were passing away. And my twin sister walked down to uh, to accept the Lord. And I was like, she's not going to go alone. I'm coming too. And so I was six years old at the time. And I, you know, looking back, I don't remember all that I understood. But I did understand that I, I had sins that needed to be washed away and that um, that I didn't want to die in my sins. I did know that. And I was a bad heathen little child, bad heathen child. Um, and so I realized that, uh, you know, all of my mischief and foolishness, the Lord did not approve of that. And that, um, that heaven would not be my home if I stayed in that state. So that is my before Christ story. Okay. So I loved how you said you were a mischievous child. <laughs> Because I remember growing up and my grandmother who passed away a couple of years ago, she said, do you remember all that stuff you used to do? So we have a kid who's on here who's listening and we want you to share just a little bit about your little mischief. Jesus be a sense. I am definitely a living testimony of the the word of the Lord and, and uh, good parenting. So for example, um, I, I used to steal. I used to take little things. I remember um, if, you, if you were born in the 80s or maybe the 90s, you remember Berenstain Bears. And I remember stealing a Berenstain Bear figurine um, from my babysitter and hiding it in the closet. Um, I remember stealing change from my dad's, uh, you know, wherever he kept his change. I would steal that money. Um, and I, this is really terrible, but one time I um, we were at my grandmother's house, and 
um, she had these little kittens and this ladder, so I could climb, <laughs> I could climb, so I climbed on top of her house with this ladder with these kittens, and I would hang the kittens over the over the dangle them by their tails, you know, over the um, over the roof. And I realized now that that was really, really awful and cruel. But at the time, I, you know, I would be just fascinated by how these cats would scramble, you know, back away. But I realized, like, you know, some serial killers started by animal cruelty. And so I'm just so thankful that God rescued me that I'm not, you know, someone who went down that path of being cruel to animals and cruel to people. So that's that's the mischief. Amen. And I love that you shared that because sometimes kids, you're you're fascinated by certain things. Believe it or not, I was a little thief too. (laughs) I stopped because I got caught. (laughs) So, um, and I realized that there's a purpose because somebody, there's somebody that you're going to reach with that story that looks at you and be like, oh, snap, you did that. And you're like, yeah, I did it. And, And it ministers to them. But the question I want to ask you as we move forward, when you went down to accept the Lord, like put the Lord on in baptism after your father preached that sermon of the death angel, what was going through your mind when you saw your sister go up to get baptized? And then it was like, wait a minute, why is she going? I need to go too. But what was going on in your mind, if you can remember, because I know you were six. So one thing that I definitely remember is not wanting to be left out. So my older sister had been baptized the previous summer. She's two years older than me. And then on this day, my twin sister and my middle sister were going down to be baptized. And so I remember thinking, I don't want to be left out. I don't want to be caught up with this death angel. And then also, God forgive me, but I was thinking about hmm, the crackers and the juice. Yep. I sure was. What is it about the crackers in the juice that makes children want to go and get baptized? <laughs> well, in the United States, we use sweet juice. In other places, they use wine. And maybe if we used wine, I wouldn't be interested. You know, I wouldn't have been interested in the crackers and the juice. But, you know, since it's grape juice, <laughs> it is appealing. <laughs> Stay with us. We'll be right back. Thank you for making it midway through this episode. We want to take a moment to sincerely thank each and every one of you who have been supporting our show. Your encouragement and positive feedback mean the world to us. We want to continue to bring you inspiring and thought-provoking content each week, and that's where we need your help. We kindly ask you to support our podcast by clicking on the link provided in the description below. Your support will enable us to grow, reach a wider audience, and continue to produce the quality content you enjoy. We truly appreciate your support and value your contribution to the Call by God podcast. Together, let's inspire and uplift others in their faith journey. Thank you once again for your continued support, and we look forward to bringing you more enlightening episodes in the future. God bless. I guess for for me, um, Sister Kim, and and that was a great question that that you asked, um, Sister Adney. Um, For me, what I like to get at is it's one thing when you, um, you know, get baptized, but it's it's another what you do after the baptism. Right. Because oftentimes people, you know, yes, you know, we hear the gospel, we repent, confess and be baptized and the whole mind, we know, hear, believe, repent, confess. We know that. So I want to hear some of the challenges that you face. you know, and, and I'm going to fast forward all the way to your young adult, like, you know, growing up as a young lady in the church, in the body of Christ, because you got baptized young. So I'm sure you went through so much um, from middle school to, to high school. So I want to talk about as, as a young adult, what was the challenges you faced being brought up in the church? Um, and, and you know, like, did you have godly friends? Did you have ungodly friends? Did you go um, encounter peer pressure? And what were some some of the challenges and how did you overcome those as a young adult? I think that it's important because, you know, young kids go through stuff, you know, like in the church and out of the church. But I want to hear from someone else brought up in the church. What were some of those challenges? Yes. So I really appreciate this question. Um, So growing up as a preacher's 
child. Um, by the grace of God, my parents um, really lived what what they taught, and I'm so thankful for that. Um, but there were some challenges um, when you're growing up and you, you're seeing your parents um, be human. Sometimes it can shake your face because you think that, um, or I thought that, well, they're Christian people, so they should be perfect, essentially. And when they weren't perfect, it really, it really was very um, disheartening, and um, and also, you know, the temptation to point the finger and say, you know, you should be doing, you know, this, that, or the other. But I think God used it because the word says, when my father and mother forsake me, then the Lord will lift me up. And so, when there were times when um, my parents were human and not perfect, God kind of stepped in and said, I am your father. And so growing up, letting go of my parents' religion and their teaching and really focusing on my own relationship with God has been the, the major challenge of my Christian journey. When I went off to college, I could not remember what it was that I was thinking when I was six. And my twin sister, when we were in college at the time, um, she was uh, she was actually dating this guy who was not a member of the church. And I remember thinking at that time, I have to choose God for me. So I was actually rebaptized um, at 18 because of this, because I wanted to make sure that despite what my parents chose, despite what my twin sister chose, that I was choosing God for myself. And so the regular, you know, the regular experiences of, of peer pressure, of, you know, dating guys that, that were not members of the church, the regular, um, I would say these are ordinary sort of pressures of feeling rejected, abandoned, um, unpretty, uh, unaccepted by peers. By the grace of God, during my um, middle school and high school years, it was like those experiences God used to draw me closer to him, um, I began to read my Bible by myself. At about 14, I began to listen to Christian music on the radio. I began to write down prayers. And, you know, interestingly enough, my best friend from, you know, 20 years ago, 25 years ago, um, found a notebook just recently, <laughs> like a three, three months ago, and I had written out prayers and Bible, um, a Bible study um, in eighth grade. And so the trial that I experienced of peer pressure, of, you know, of issues with my parents, God used those to draw me closer to him. So I am so grateful for that. Wow, Kim, thank you for sharing that. Because again, you know, sometimes, you know, children make the decision to put the Lord on, Lord on in baptism. And they sometimes they do it because they see someone else do it. But when it gets to that state of, you know what, I know Jesus for myself, because Job says and Job, um, I believe it's Job 42, where he says, I knew of God. Right. But now I see him. There's a huge difference of knowing and seeing God. So when you had that moment of, OK, I knew you. But now I see you. So I want to have a relationship with you. Now we're going to fast forward to college because I want, okay, I don't want you to feel uncomfortable, but I need you to get to a state of sharing your story. When you had your mental break, I want you to share that with the audience because somebody somewhere is dealing with mental health issues and they don't even know what to do. So can you share that with us, please? Yes. So... Um, throughout college, I was very active in a Bible study on campus um, where people were literally hearing the gospel and being baptized every week, and college students were being baptized and becoming members of the Lord's Church. And um, I was also experiencing these intimate, wonderful, intimate moments with God in prayer, in, um, in, in devotion every morning. And so when I tell you 
They were so beautiful and so wonderful. I felt so loved up by God and so close to him. So that was college. I went off to graduate school. And for the first time, I was away from my twin sister. Um, I was in uh, going from a, a historically black college that even though it was a public university, welcomed God. Um, we said prayers. We sang songs of worship on a regular basis throughout um, you know, our university culture. And so transitioning into a predominantly white public institution, a research one, where honestly it seemed like knowledge was their God, um, religiously it felt like I was under attack. And then also racial discrimination. We know that that is a reality for um, many people of color in this country. And so I was experiencing um, the, the loss of being around a family or around my twin. I was experiencing racial discrimination. I was experiencing um, attacks, you know, on my, on my face for what seemed like the first time. And I, um, then in the fall, two of my good friends from college passed away. Um, by the end of December, the relationship that I was in, the romantic relationship that I was in, was in being dissolved. And so I began to hear um, voices. I began to not be able to sleep at night. And um, it was a very scary time. I thought that I could only pray, only read scripture, and get through it. But by the grace of God, the sisters at my congregation saw me. They saw that my hair was disheveled. My clothes were disheveled. Um, I was um, had some sort of obsessive sort of, you know, um, things that I was saying. I was saying things like, um, looking back, I was in, in really in a bad place. But I remember some of my sisters asking me, hey, do you want to join us for a vacation? For spring break. And I remember telling them that an angel had told me that if I left the city, I would die. Right. And so I was calling my dad throughout the day, crying hysterically and saying, you know, you know, basically I heard this voice tell me this, this, this. And so, you know, being, having so many sleepless nights consecutively because my body literally could not sleep. Hearing voices, um, be, my insides hurt, literally. Um, and I, I thought, okay, I just need to pray more. I need to read my Bible more. Um, and so it, it became overwhelming and um, painful in a way that um, it's hard to go back to remember. But um, it, it, it felt very, very hopeless by the grace of God, to see that my congregation saw me and they said, we're going to come to the house and we're going to take you to the mental health hospital or the area, the mental health area at the hospital. And that's what they did. By the grace of God, they stood next to me through, uh, through that as I got the evaluation from the doctor. And uh, the doctor asked me after the evaluation, if I wanted to be admitted. And so um, I definitely did not understand the gravity of what it was that I was going through um, in terms of uh, the fact that it was really a psychotic break. It was, I was in full blown mental health crisis. And so um, it, it was, it was quite a challenge, um, quite a challenge. I would not wish it, wish it on my worst enemy but I'm so grateful that the Lord took me to that and that he's brought me, that he's brought me through it. Amen. Um, the reason I asked this question and it just touched my heart because like my eyes started tearing up just thinking of it is that there are so many people in this world who are dealing with that and people just think, oh, they're crazy and they don't realize, especially in the body of Christ. This is not a subject that we discuss, mental health. Um, we don't re when we hear the battle of your mind, you don't think that that's something that happens. It's just like pray about it, get in your word. And it's just like God is like, hmm, I have therapists out there for a reason and a purpose. Use them. You know, I've called these people to this profession. So what I want you to share with us is 
um, when you when you had the mental break and you um, started going through treatments, did you find out from like your relatives that this was something that happened in, in the family before? Like, could you share that with us as well? Absolutely. So one of the gifts, I had so many gifts. Like I said, my, my church family, um, my, my sister came down to help to take me to the different doctors. And my dad, by the grace of God, he is a psychiatrist uh, as well as a minister of the gospel and currently an elder. And so I trusted him. Um, I didn't trust the other doctors. I was thinking <laughs> they're not Christians. They're probably, you know, the devil's probably trying to use them to trip me up. You know, this is really just crazy thinking at that time. And by crazy thinking, I don't mean the actual mental health crisis, but the stuff that we hear, like you can't go to a, to a therapist that's not a Christian. You can't go to a counselor that's not a Christian, you know. Um, but that's what I mean when I say crazy thinking. Um, and so um, for me, my dad was able to say, wait a minute, there's this drug. So he kind of served on, on, um, on a panel or a board or something um, where he was familiar with a particular drug and a particular class of drugs. And so he was able to say, try this one, because we didn't know exactly what it was. Um, but we knew the, the symptoms looked like certain uh, looked like certain um, certain mental health um, issues, and so he was able to say, "Try this drug." And so when I first started the journey, doctors were trying to prescribe some different things, and they weren't working, and that was very devastating. <laughs> and but finally, there was a drug that did work in terms of the sleepless nights and the racing thoughts and everything. And then from there, once I was out of crisis mode, the voices were not, you know, were, were leaving and I was able to sleep. Then I was able to work with a counselor. And um, the counselor was not a member of the Church of Christ, but this person was a trained counselor that was able to, you know, talk with me, allow me to talk through things. And that was truly, truly a blessing. Um, I would say, though, that I did go through that struggle of people who were not familiar with mental health issues, but that love the Lord would tell me, if you just pray about it, you can get off your medication. Don't don't depend on that medication. Just pray more. Just read your Bible more. And so I would go through these times of I'll stop taking the medication without any doctor's orders without um, being under a doctor's supervision. And so I would just stop taking the medication and I would have lots of, um, lots of physical issues and also mental struggles when I would just stop the medication on my own. Um, and that is not what anyone is supposed to do at all. But I was doing that, trying to depend on myself, trying to depend on my own practice of prayer. One thing that my dad says is sometimes we pray to God, but we want him to answer the way we want him to answer. We want it to come a certain way. And for me, I was like, no, I should only be able to pray and it'd be gone. I shouldn't have to take medicine. I shouldn't have to go to a doctor. I shouldn't have to, um, you know, eat right and, and go to sleep, right? And so one thing that I say here is, that we are three part beings. And so often as Christians, we arrogantly try to act like we're only a spirit being. That is so crazy because um, I laughingly say, You didn't make that list. Like, I'm sorry, Boo Boo, but you are not on the angel list. Angels are spirit beings, but we have a mind, we have a spirit, and we have a body. And we cannot use spirit tools to deal with a physical situation. And what I mean by that is we do pray through everything. We do fast. We do seek God's word. But when God needed to feed his people, he gave them not only the spiritual of, of his word, but physical bread. When God needed to give his people, when his people were thirsty, he gave them living water in the form of Christ 
but he also gave them water. When Jesus came, he healed the sick and raised the dead. He was working in the spirit realm of releasing people from demons, releasing people from sin, but he was also working in the, in the physical realm of healing people from diseases. And so to that I say, as Christians, we have to remember that we cannot arrogantly act as if we are only spirit being and neglect the physical. And so um, that is what I was doing, neglecting the physical and, and kind of demanding that God answer my prayer the way I wanted, without medical intervention, without seeking treatment, without having a self-care plan in place. And so I will say to every Christian, humble yourself, accept the fact that you are a three-part being, and care for yourself. Be a good steward over all three parts. Amen. So I thank you for sharing that. Um, now, because uh, you missed a part of my question, <laughs> um, is the mental health part, is it um, hereditary? Is, it, it, is there anyone else in your family who suffered with mental health um, issues and, and share that? And then um, I want to ask this question so that way you can just go ahead and answer it. As you're a teacher, you speak, you teach Spanish, right? You're a black, uh, African-American woman teaching Spanish. So to me, that's, that blows my mind. So what made you go into the field of teaching Spanish and um, teaching period? So I'm going to talk to you about an experience that I had as a teacher to answer your question about hereditary, heredity. Um, yes. This uh, mental health issues do run in my family. I have a great, great grandmother that <laughs> if you saw a picture of her, you would literally say, Kimberly is the fitting image of that woman. And I am. But you know how it is when families are estranged. Someone has divorced. Someone has abandoned. Someone has left the relationship. And <clears throat> For me, it was my grandparents. My, my grandmother and my grandfather divorced when my father was four. And so growing up, we didn't know my grandfather's side of the family. But when, um, by the grace of God, my dad was reunited with one of his biological siblings. And she kind of guided us into meeting this other side of the family. And so um, my dad tells this story of the first time he saw this picture of our great great grandmother, and he looked up. It was a picture that was like above the bed of his of his great of my great grandmother, his grandmother, who was on her deathbed. And he looks up and sees this picture, and he's like, "Oh my gosh, there there is where Kim got her eyes from, right?" Well, from what we understand, um, this 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 relative, my great great grandmother, and her sister back in the twenties were admitted to um, what we now know as psychiatric hospitals. Back then, they would have called them asylums, insane asylums or things like that. And so, yes, it, it is, It is um, for me, having this, this particular mental illness, it is a genetic thing that has been, that, you know, gets expressed. Um, <clears throat> when I turned um, in my early 20s, and often for many people that have, mental illness in the family, it is in that those 20s and 30s, usually when if it's coming, if it's there, it's going to come out, right? Um, so as a teacher, I had an experience. It was Black History Month. I was teaching performing arts at the time. And I was getting ready to go into this unit about Black history and our Black history performance. So I had this book that I had bought from the International Civil Rights Museum that had uh, that had uh, um, stories of of, of um, enslaved people, and my students were like, "Let's how do you read us this story?" So I opened this story, and this it's the story of of an enslaved man named Frank Sales. That is my great grandfather's very name. And as I was reading the story, there was a case where, after his master died, he he you know runs away and is in this field. And he has an hallucination day after day of his master, who was dead, standing over him, beating him and speaking to him, right? And come to find out 
this person that's in this slave narrative is my great is my great grandfather's grandfather. And so when we think of being African American people in this country and the trauma that we collectively have experienced through these years across these these centuries, there is no escaping the fact that this trauma is something that we have to deal with, not only spiritually, but in our mental health. Hey Amen. That that is so powerful. I mean I was just sitting back and, and Sister Kim, I'm I'm glad that you shared your experience about, you know, your your mental health. Cause this this need to be said because a lot of people deal with this every day and um they don't know how to overcome it. You know, people in the church and outside the church. And I'm glad that you're very transparent about your experience. But um but what I wanted to know, and you can share this with our listeners, um, and I'm I'm sure you probably touched on it, but I just probably want you to reiterate it if you haven't done so. Um, if you haven't really touched on it, I want you to share your wow moment. Okay. Cause it's one thing when you go through situations, you know, you're, you get delivered from something and after deliver, after the deliverance, God always puts you in a position to be able to uh, minister to people of what you've gone through. So it's two part. I want you to share your wow moment and what has God put you to do as it relates to the mental health or anything else to propel you to greater heights, to do more for his kingdom. So I want you to share share some of that. Okay, so the wow moment. Um, I was diagnosed 14 years ago. And it wasn't until 2020 with this pandemic that God really, really spoke to me about letting go of the shame. Um, it took me a moment, again, as I said, to accept that I... I have a mental health diagnosis and that with this being my thorn in my flesh, I have to humble myself, accept the, the gift of, of treatment, accept the gift of therapist and having therapy and then accept myself as I am to love me. So that moment happened in the spring of 2020, um, 13 years after the diagnosis. And um, it was about really the Lord telling me to forgive myself, forgive myself for not being perfect and let go of this idea that in order for me to love me, that I had to somehow be perfect and not have any blemishes, right? And it was really about understanding that I have to love me more like God loves me. And so often we talk about loving other people and forgiving other people. And having these fruit of the spirit, the Lord spoke to me almost audibly and said, Ken, you don't have a relationship problem with me and you don't have a relationship problem with other people. You have a relationship problem with yourself. You've got to forgive yourself, release yourself from the bondage of this expectation of perfection. Stop that. Um, because of course, if you have this idea that I can only be loved once nothing's wrong with me anymore. Of course, if, you, if you're dealing with a mental health challenge, you know, you're never going to get to the place of loving you. And God doesn't want us to love him, ourselves, or anyone else with this idea of you've got to be perfect in order for me to love you, right? We know God is perfect, and so we do love him. But um, that, was, that was the wow moment. That particularly was the wow moment, because then I was able to release the shame. And so um, God blessed me after having that moment with him to write the book, Love Letters to Baby Girl. And it's a, it's a devotional book. It is, it goes through the scripture, Ezekiel 16, 6 through 14. And in that scripture, we see God in, in so many ways, being God the Father, being God lover of our souls, being God, um, God uh, as a husband. And so um, for me in this book, God called me to be very transparent, not only about the mental health diagnosis from 14 years ago, but all of the day-to-day -day things, right? All of the day-to-day -day doubts, fears, and experiences that I've had along the way. I think Kirk Franklin said that sometimes we're eager to share with the world our scriptures, but we don't share with them our scars. 
And, you know, by that, I think um, we, we have to be honest with the world about the things we struggle with as Christians and about the way that God is giving us the victory, is giving us the help, the triumph, the beauty for ashes, so that they can understand being a Christian is not about a perfect walk. It's not about showing up perfect and doing everything God wants us to do so that we can say, I did it perfectly. But it's about a loving relationship with the God who pursues us relentlessly and who says that there's nothing that can separate us from his love and a God who does provide relief. So with the book, Love Letters to Baby Girl, that's what that's about. Amen. Amen. I, I like what you said, uh, Sister Kim, when you said that you have to forgive yourself. So I'm going to say that, listener, child of God, let it go. Forgive yourself. Stop feeling shame. Stop feeling guilt. Because Christ, Christ, Jesus Christ died for all of that guilt, shame, forgiveness. He paid the price. He paid the price for us. So you don't need to feel that way, child of God. So I'm, I, I like when you said that because we have a hard time of forgiving ourselves. We feel shame. Oh, I did this. And it's hard to let go. It could take years of letting things go. So, and, and I'm sure I'm about to ask you this one, one last question. This is, we're just going to close out uh, shortly, but sister Kim, I want you to talk directly to a listener, young man, young lady, a uh, young adult, young man, um, an adult man, an adult woman, give them some word of, of encouragement. Okay. Um, my dear brother or sister, I want you to know, that God loves you and he is pursuing you. He is pursuing your heart. You're not holding on to him. He's holding on to you. No matter what trial that you're facing right now, God does have relief. It is his will that you live life and that you live it more abundantly. Because if Christ says, I came and you might have life and have it more abundantly. So please don't live beneath your privilege. As a kingdom kid, as a royal priesthood, God has gifts for you. People who may not even be, may not even know him. He can use those people to bless you. Open your hands to receive his blessing, to receive his forgiveness, to receive his grace, right? Receive God's grace. And know that no matter what, he is pursuing you. Again, it's not about you holding on to him. He's holding on to you. And nothing can separate you from his love. Hey, man, I like that. Oh, man, <laughs> this was good. This was good. So Sister Kim Hardy, she, I always, you know, I told Sister Kim Hardy, she has a celebrity name. And by the way, she's a celebrity in Christ Jesus. Amen. So, Sister Kim, I want you to share with our listeners, what are you doing? Where, where can they find you? What are the platforms that you're doing? What ministries? And I know you shared the book, but I want you to reiterate a lot of that information, the things that you already haven't shared. Where can the people reach you and what are you involved in? Okay. So, um, one thing that God has shown me during this pandemic is we do not have to go it alone. Let's call in our tribe, Right. And so um, I'm a single woman and um, God really, you know, showed me that how often in the church, single people are not getting a word about what they're, what they're living through as single people. And um, so by the grace of God, God um, has brought a, an amazing group of women together in the form of a virtual community called Jesus Sprinkle. And Jesus Sprinkle is about um, encouraging women in the body of Christ that are single. And um, the Jesus Sprinkle is about cur encouraging us, particularly around our desire for marriage. And so um, that's been such a blessing. Agni is one of the administrators with, um, with Jesus Sprinkle, and we work to bring God-written love stories so that people can understand and hope in what God can do in terms of their love life, in terms of their desire for kingdom marriage, um, I'm also launching a campaign in 2021 called God Calls Me Baby Girl. And it's about reconciling our experiences of mental health with 
our experience of accepting our and living our in full glory and living up to our, our privilege as daughters of the King, um, that the mental health challenges that we, that we face um, should not be suffered through in silence. Um, and that we are God's children, no matter what we go through, but particularly as it relates to mental health challenges. Um, you can find me on Facebook at, Kim, at Kimberly Annette. Um, and you can find me on Instagram, KimberlyAnnette.96. My email address is K-I-M-H-D-Y at Yahoo.com. Feel free to reach out to me. Um, I love I love communing and fellowshipping with God's people and talking about uh, mental health awareness and our own struggles with mental health to break us free as Christian people, to break us free from the stigma. All right. So that's that's what that's what I'm about. And I look forward to to connecting with anyone in the future. Amen. Amen. I like that. And and I. Uh, artist once said, all my single ladies, all my single ladies. So y'all heard it. Y'all check out Jesus Sprinkle. Um, she's on YouTube and it's phenomenal. Jesus Sprinkle. I think she, uh, um, sister, correct me if I'm wrong, sister Kim, I believe you have a platform on uh, YouTube uh, for Jesus Sprinkle. That is correct. Yes, we sure do. So after we record with our couples, we, we put it on the, on the YouTube channel. So anyone who wants to listen to these amazing God-written love stories of Christians that are in love and married, and also shout out to Black Love, because our couples are also African-American Christians. <laughs> yeah, so the YouTube channel is Jesus Sprinkle. All right, world. So y'all go ahead and y'all check it out again. Sister Kim, we want to thank you again for joining our show. It was definitely a blessing to to have you on here. So until then, you know, we're going to close out world. You know, this was a very great episode. I've learned a lot, a lot from my sister in Christ. And it was just good overall just to hear what people go through from all walks, walks of life in the body and out of the body of Christ. And remember that Jesus Christ is king. He is still good. He's the Lord of Lord, the king of kings. He's the alpha and the omega. He is my king. So remember to always put him first, no matter what you're going through. That's it for now. But before we go, please continue to listen, subscribe, and share our podcast. Also, if you want to support our show, please scroll down to the bottom of the show notes and click on the link that says buy me a coffee. We would greatly appreciate it. Thank you for listening. And remember, God is good all the time and all the time. God is good. And also, Jesus Christ loves you. Thank you. Wait, there's more. What if today was your last day on earth? Would you be ready to meet your maker? Well, Jesus Christ has given us the good news. He told his disciples in Mark 16, 15, 16, and he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. Jesus Christ has instructed his children to share and preach the gospel, which is the good news, which means that Jesus Christ came and that he was sacrificed. He was buried and he rose on the third day by believing and by repenting and confessing and being baptized. You will be saved. So it is your choice. Jesus Christ will not force you. You've heard the message. You heard personal testimonies. But this is your opportunity to give your life to Christ. Don't wait until tomorrow, because tomorrow is not promised. So I hope you submit to the will of God and give your soul to Christ. Be blessed.